The gentleman from Kansas, Mr. LaTurner, is recognized. Mr. LaTurner. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Once again, this committee had a real opportunity to hold a bipartisan oversight hearing to get to the bottom of the events of January 6th. We should have had witnesses, such as the former Capitol Police Chief, the former House Sergeant at Arms, that could speak specifically to the breakdowns in leadership and communication on that day. But sadly, that has not happened. Our job should be to hold the leadership accountable who failed, hold the people that committed these crimes accountable, make sure that this never happens again, uh, and finally, focus on bringing this country back together to work on their behalf in the halls of Congress. That's what they expect uh, in partisan hearings like this, further to hurt our ability to do that. First and foremost, um, I want to ask uh, Director Ray, what have you learned over the last five months that will ensure that something like this never happens again? Uh, a number of things, but I'll just list off a few that are top of mind for me these days. You know, one is uh, that we need to develop better human sources uh, to, to be able to better anticipate uh, violent extremism. Second, we need to improve our data analytics uh, because, as I said in response to one of the earlier questions, the volume, just the terabytes and terabytes of information that are descending upon investigators, including at the FBI, uh, is like nothing we've ever experienced before. And so the, the need to get through it fast and separate, as I said before, uh, the wheat from the chaff uh, is at a premium. And then third, we're gonna have to deal with the encryption issue because what we've seen time and again, we saw it in relation to the January 6th attack, but we also saw it over the summer with the violence that occurred there, the bad guys, are communicating in ways that are right around the edges of the First Amendment on social media, but then they switch over to encrypted devices and encrypted messaging platforms to communicate the stuff that's most revealing and that's most likely to allow us to better uh, spot the, the difference between the intentional from the aspirational. So those are three things that I think are particularly important, but they're gonna be a whole host of lessons that we learn out of this, and we're actively engaged in that process. Thank you, Director. While I have you, I also want to talk about a growing concern for the people I represent back in Kansas, as well as Americans across this country, and I know that it's a concern for you. Um, you recently compared uh, the ongoing ransomware threat to global terrorism and even 9-11. Can you talk to me a little bit about the interaction that the FBI has with CISA and how we can improve the communication that these federal uh, these federal agencies have with each other to better serve the, the private sector that is getting hammered with ransomware attacks? Uh, so certainly, Congressman, I appreciate the question. Uh, first, let me just be clear. When I was using the analogy to 9-11, I was referring to the challenge that this presents and the, what kind of response is called for uh, in response, as opposed to comparing the ransomware threat to the attack itself. On I, I knew what you meant, Director, and I apologize for not being more clear. The, the challenge is just as great, though. I agree. Go ahead. Yeah, it, it, and, and what's called for is something very similar to what this country did when it pulled together after 9-11, which is uh, a whole of government, in many ways, whole of society response involving all the agencies, involving the private sector, involving average Americans even. Uh, with our foreign partners to, to disrupt in a coordinated way the attack. And so we are working much more closely. You mentioned CISA. Uh, I think over the last few years, the partnership between the FBI and CISA has, has kind of grown by leaps and bounds. Uh, we each have a role to play. We each complement each other. Uh, we try to communicate to the victim companies that uh, if you reach out to one of us, you're reaching out to both of us and we'll get the other involved if you don't need to call both right away. Uh, simultaneously. Uh, they, they are focused on protecting the asset. We're focused on chasing after the threat. Well, so my think concern, about the FBI, we're after the who did it. My concern, piece. before I run out of time, Director, and, and I'd like you to respond, is that we have CISA and we have the FBI, obviously Department of, Department of Defense. We have people involved on the offensive and defensive side of this. And my concern is, is that we don't have one central, uh, one central force directing and coordinating all of these uh, federal assets to make sure that this runs more smoothly. Do you have a comment on that? 
Well, I think, uh, as is true in, in terrorism, there's not one agency that coordinates all terrorism efforts, uh, but what is clearly called for is coordination uh, and joint sequenced operations. Uh, we, for example, have the National Cyber Investigative Joint Task Force, where we have multiple agencies there uh, working with us. So there are vehicles like that to ensure proper coordination. And with that, I think you and I are, are very much on the same page. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Time has expired. In the FBI's view, the top domestic violent extremist threat comes from racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists, specifically those who advocate for the superiority of the white race. That is an absolute flat out lie. It is not our greatest threat. Not once in his speech today did Merrick Garland mention last summer's BLM riots or skyrocketing crime on our streets, the riots we still see week in and week out. How about Merrick Garland? You condemn this man on your screen, Justin Tyran Roberts, arrested for shooting five people in a 20 hour shooting spree in Georgia over the weekend. You know why he did it, according to investigators? They insist he was intentionally targeting white, military-looking men. That sounds racially motivated to me. He didn't mention that. No mention of this black-on-white crime because it doesn't fit their divisive narrative. These are stories that are actually happening in America. How about we stop issuing fake warnings about crime based off of political agendas and start prosecuting all criminals no matter what color they are. When you're up there, are you just getting tired of being told you're a racist, I'm a racist, everybody watching is a racist? Yeah. They have to talk about January 6th, and they have to talk about things that divide us on, uh, along racial grounds. It is, it is so wrong, but that's who the Democrats are today. They're this radical left-wing party, and they have nothing else positive to talk about, so they have to go here. You know, you look at January 6th, everybody has said it was a tragic day, it never should have yep. happened, they wanted people that were violent and destructive put away. But, you know, I was looking at Senator Ron Johnson, he looked at hours and hours and hours of tapes, and he was like something like 40% of the people were just let in by Capitol Police. But they don't talk about any of that, and you have SWAT teams showing up in California at somebody's house trying to rouse them out of the house for walking around taking selfies inside that Capitol. It isn't right, Congressman. Or how about the couple in Alaska who weren't even in the Capitol? I mean, look, you're right. We Republicans have been, conservatives have been consistent. We condemned the violence that took place on January 6th, and we condemned all of it that took place all last summer with all these, uh, in all these metropolitan areas around our, around our great country. The Democrats are the ones who have been hip hypocrites on this. They did, they, last summer was fine. That was a righteous cause. But then they focused on, on January 6th. But the couple in Alaska who weren't even in the Capitol, the FBI kicks in their door, holds them at gunpoint, handcuffs them, interrogates them for four hours. They got the wrong couple. And then they take their phones, their laptop, and their pocket-sized copy of the Constitution. Talk about, I mean, that, that, there's got to be irony in that, that, that fact alone. So, yeah, that, where's the consistency that we would like from everyone? We've been consistent. I wish the Democrats would do the same. Yeah. Well, there's my pocket constitution. I carry it with me all over the place. And I'm in Texas, Congressman. Come and take it. Usually we're talking about guns. This time I'm talking about my constitution. In the FBI's view, the top domestic violent extremist threat comes from racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists, specifically those who advocate for the superiority of the white race. Garland did not provide any numbers or statistics to back up this claim, but pointed to past racially motivated shootings and attacks, as well as the January 6th riot on Capitol Hill. Noticeably, Garland spent his entire 26-minute speech without even mentioning the summer of riots one time, simply ignoring months of attacks on police and federal buildings and cities all across this country as if it just didn't happen. Steve, I think this shows how politicized Biden's DOJ has really become ignoring vi radical violent groups like Antifa, like BLM, simply because they support the left-wing agenda. Yeah, unfortunately, it's another example of two sets of rules or two sets of narratives, really, in a way. And the narrative being spread here, of course, is that that January 6th 
is, uh, was a, a riot that somehow endangered the American Republic, which is not in any sense true. It was an unarmed riot, inexcusable for, to be sure, but unarmed. No, not one person has been charged with having a firearm inside the Capitol that day, and it lasted a few hours. To try to compare that to weeks of rage and carnage up, across the summer last year in 2020 um, is just totally ludicrous and illogical. Unfortunately, that's right where Merrick Garland went. They're essentially pitting Americans against one another by labeling it ba via basically a race war, which is essentially what they're implying with that statement. And I don't agree with it. And I think it's absolutely horrifying to see that you have the DOG, DOJ essentially being weaponized against the American people. There was, a, there was a rally in Chicago of white supremacists on January 25th. And they put out a national call and they got 80 people to show up in Chicago. And according to one expert, five people were from the Chicago area. Out of about, what, eight or nine million people who live in Chicago, there were five people, right? And so a lot of this uh, the southern, the, relies on the Southern Poverty Law Center and the statistics that they put out and the media regurgitate that. And so I think we have to be careful. Certainly, I, I do not trust the media uh, on this issue because they, they have proven themselves to be uh, you know, not reliable when it comes to being partisan and pushing certain narratives. So um, is white supremacy... Is there some in the United States? Absolutely. Is it the most uh, biggest threat to, to America? I think that's overblown. And I think that the administration is pushing it for their own political reasons. You know, it seems to me that race relations in America in recent decades have improved so dramatically that things like, for example, interracial marriages are totally unremarkable in America today. Uh, and it is not considered acceptable in polite society at all to have racist views. And yet we have people like Garland and Joe Biden who want to insist that the country is systemically racist. Are they essentially protesting a struggle that has already been won in American culture? You know, there has been tremendous progress in this country. And, and for a lot of folks uh, on the left to, to, as they're saying now, this is, you know, voting rights, it's Jim Crow 2.0, that there's been no progress made since the 1960s or even the 1860s. I mean, that it, most Americans understand that's ludicrous. I mean, that is gaslighting, right? That is an absolute gaslighting right. of the American people. And so I think, uh, again, in our normal everyday lives, we do not see the bogeymen that are being made out. There are not Klansmen walking around the corner. There are not white supremacists uh, gathering on street corners. And so I think, uh, you know, that ultimately falls flat to the American people because that's not what we see and we live in our day-to-day -day lives. Right. And we understand that racism is really, uh, you know, has, has been a thing of the past. I mean, does it still exist today? Sure it does in certain areas. But is the, is the country systemically racist and oppressive? I don't think most people believe that.